recording. Well, welcome back to the second part of the transcriptive, transcriptomics with non-model organisms uh, focus form webinar. My name is Blake Joyce. Uh, hopefully you guys all met me last month, but if not, I'm a science analyst uh, with, and a, or a science repetition is what we're calling ourselves these days, uh, with Cyverse. And uh, we started off last month we started off last month um, with the pipeline uh, to do non-model organism de novo transcriptomics. And we assessed raw faster reads from the sequencing. We were able to trim those and filter them. Um, and then uh, we moved into doing the assembly using Trinity. And that was on, the, uh, on an atmosphere cloud image. And I, we got to describe quite a lot of bit about the cloud and how you actually access it. And then we got as far as actually assessing that assembly with RNA cloth and looking at some of the outputs from RNA cloth. And so today we're going to finish this back half. That is to say that we're going to be doing annotation of all of the transcripts. So trying to figure out what those transcripts are and perhaps what their biological function is. And to also identify uh, differential gene expression between two different conditions. Um, this will be multiple pairwise or even just pairwise comparisons, um, and we'll get into that a little later. So even though I made this slide, I'm actually going to do this in a bit of a different way today. And I'm going to do the annotation first, because that's going to be an atmosphere, and then I'm going to do the differential gene expression uh, second, uh, towards the end. And so the, you can actually do it either way. Some people like to do the differential gene expression first find genes of interest, and then only annotate just those genes of interest. Um, I am going to do all of the genes uh, first and then do the differential gene expression um, second. So that way, uh, if you were trying to publish, say, a completely new um, transcriptome from a new organism, you would have all of those transcripts uh, structurally or functionally annotated. And then you could dig down into just the differential gene expression. And so um, that's, that's how I chose to do it today. And again, you can do it either way. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both, of course. So we're going to switch over. And I'm going to close my log. So last time we got as far as, close some of this. Last time we got all the way to the assembly. And here's the folder I was dumping everything into. And so the Trinity output this FASTA, and um, we use these two reads to build those, that assembly. And as you can tell, these are really small because these are just example data sets that Trinity includes with um, their package. So the only thing that uh, we're going to do um, is uh, we're going to take, go back to where we generated this uh, FASTA assembly in Atmosphere. And so this is the interface for atmosphere. I had created a project called non-model assembly annotation. And I had started up this instance. I suspended it in during the last month and then I resumed it just a few days ago. And so we're going to open that back up and it's actually here so we can just refresh. And this is exactly the same state as I left it um, uh, you know, one month ago when I was doing the first half of this seminar um, and teaching everybody. So these were all of our outputs. Um, these are those reads that I just showed you that we use to assemble the annotation. And then in here in the Trinity out directory is the Trinity um, FASTA assembly. So I will actually move there and I'll show it to you. So, and there's the Trinity FASTA file. So that's actually our assembly right there using their example data. So the only other thing that we're going to do is uh, we're now going to switch over from doing that assembly and do the annotation in Trinity. And for sake of time, I'm going to walk you through a few of the, uh, the setup pieces of Trinity, and I'm going to uh, show you how to run the very first bit of Trinity. Trinity is actually not a single tool. It is many tools put together to create a very large meta tool or whatever you want to call it. Um, so let us move to the Trinity folder. And here we go. So here is the Trinity. This is version two. Um, there is a version three available and we are actually starting to deploy that. So you'll see some changes in the next few weeks. Things are always being updated. Things are always being uh, 
uh, changed and updated and all that. And the documentation that's associated with this will also be uh, updated inside the wiki and reference the new Trinitate um, GitHub uh, manual. And I'll show you guys that here in just a second. So I'm gonna go into the Trinitate folder. And of course, all of these commands will be, are available on the wiki as well. So you can just copy and paste if you're not comfortable with using um, the shell commands. I know that I wasn't um, when I first got started. So in here, you can see this is the command to run Trinitate. And all of the commands to actually run it are found here in the Trinitate documentation. And Trinity and Trinitate have done a really great job of documenting literally everything and how to actually run these. And so this is why I think running this on the command line is actually possible even for beginning command line uh, users because you, all you have to do is sort of copy and paste this command and then just change one or two little things. So the very first part of uh, setting up Trinitate is actually downloading all the software. And you can see there's a giant list of all the software you have to download and change and modify. Well, we've actually already done that for you. And that's already in that image. And you can see here that we've already got RNA Hammer installed, we have Signal P installed, we have SQLite installed, we have Bowtie, and Blast, and Hammer, and all of those tools that all go together to make uh, Trinity. We've already installed them, configured them, set them up, so you actually can completely skip that first step. And in the wiki, I don't even mention any of this. Uh, it just We just skip right over it. And so that's one of the advantages of using uh, some of these uh, platforms like Atmosphere. Um, once somebody configures it once and then saves that image, no one else has to go through and change all of that stuff. Generally, also, uh, the second step uh, you would have to do is you would have to download two databases. That's the Uniprot database and the PFAN database. And then you would have to set up those databases and then unzip them and prepare them. But again, that's already installed and ready to go for you. Um, through a script that we include in the image as it starts up. So you get your cloud computer, it all gets tied together, and then it runs a custom script that I and Capil made um, and does all of this for you as well. So you can also completely skip this step. And that's really nice because the Uniprot database is 10 or 11 gigabytes now, and trying to download 10 or 11 gigabytes could take a fair amount of time especially when you're doing it over a Wi-Fi connection or if you're doing it at home or something like that. So it's kind of a huge advantage that we're able to skip over that as well. So um, that actually allows us to get right into running the, the app. And so all we need to do that is the Trinity FASTA file that we generated last time and I pointed out earlier in this web, uh, webinar. And then we need one more thing, and that is to take that FASTA assembly and turn it into uh, open reading frame. And you can actually do that in the discovery environment. And that's my preferred method of doing it. And I've already done it here, but I will go ahead and show you really quickly. Uh, if you go into apps and then look for something called transdecoder, transdecoder. You open up transdecoder and it's a very simple interface like we had seen before with some of the trimming apps and things we had done in the discovery environment. Uh, the main, all you have to do is input that assembly. So I'll go ahead and run it. There's our assembly. Input that. I'm going to put a, this is the default minimum peptide size. If you were interested in really small peptides, you of course could change that to whatever number you'd like. Generally, I think about secondary metabolism and uh, metabolism genes, and there's very few that are less than 100 peptides. So I usually leave that to be. And then of course, you can also change the genetic code that's used. Uh, there's a universal, which is all of the A's, T's, G's, and C's and how they get turned into peptides. But there's a few here that are also included if you have, if you're working with species that are outside of that universal code. And then there's also really long ORFs. So usually things uh, over 900 get thrown out. And so here they've set, retain everything to 900. And literally we just launch the analysis. So we just give it the one FASTA, it's going to run, and here in a second, it'll complete and return all of the uh, all the open reading frames and all the peptides associated with that. Of course, I've already done that, and this is what the output looks like. It'll give you a GFF3, which is, um, which is uh, the annotation file, but it also gives you this .pep, and that's what we really need, is this Trinity FASTA transdecoder .pep. 
So what I'm going to do now is because this is in the data store in in the discovery environment, all I have to do is move this from there over to my atmosphere image. And to do that, it's kind of simple actually. I'm just going to copy this big long path. This is going to tell the computer to go into each of these folders and then go and find me this file right here. So I'm going to copy that. And actually, I believe we can do that even faster. And we're going to go over here to atmosphere. And I'm going to say, I get and paste all that information in there. Paste. That did not work well. Uh, the joys of live demos. It's not going to work for me. Awesome. So we can do this the old fashioned way. We can look and see what's, what's here. So we're actually going to be working inside of this folder. That's where all of that is. So I'm going to say I get and then type the Jove. That should be tab completing too. I will make a note that that's not working. All right. Two little things, but that's okay. So when, whenever this, uh, whenever this sort of happens, this is actually kind of nice because now I can actually practice my, my simple way of doing all of this instead of using my fancy tricks. I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to paste that set there, and then I will look and see where's the next folder again. So I'm going to move into um, the Trinity example data folder, subfolder, copy, and say I change directory, paste. And then what we want is uh, the assembly. So I'm just going to say I change directory, assembly. And we're finally getting down. Here's the last one we're going to do. And this is the um, transcript decoder analysis. I'm going to copy that and move into that directory as well. One last time. And ta-da, with a little bit of effort, that's the, full, the file we want. So I'm just going to tell Atmosphere to get that from the data store. So it's I get and paste the file name. I get. Sometimes uh, you get these uh, these errors for permissions, and so if you type sudo, it will ask for my password. If I can type my password, apparently I'm having trouble typing my password. <laughs> oh, it's Friday. That's weird. I don't know what's going on now. Very strange. Can you just paste the full path? Uh, it yeah. Disrupt it. Yeah, I can definitely do that. That's a good idea. Let's try that. So a lot of uh, working with the computation is when little things like this happen is troubleshooting. Much like any other kind of science, you wind up troubleshooting a little bit. Do I get the full path? No. Operation optimized. That is so weird. Oh, okay. Maybe uh, it had like logged me out. Very weird. Yes, yeah, so the I and it, he did reinitialized everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried I'm just not typing my password correctly, which definitely happens. Get error for transcript decoder analysis status. Very strange. Okay, well, I will look into that because this was working yesterday. <laughs> so, again, the wonders of live demonstrations, there's always something that pops up like that. 
Uh, on the upside, I've actually already done all of this, um, so I can just go ahead and show you um, that. I'm not sure what that area is. I've never seen that before, but I will look into it a little later on today to make sure that when you guys are repeating this, that doesn't happen to you. All right. So, and it, we've had some troubles with our network, and I'm wondering if it's maybe something weird with my my network settings. Um, here at the University of Arizona, we've had some trouble with the external network talking out. All right. Well, without further ado, uh, I've actually already done all of this, so I can just go ahead and move forward, and I will go back and troubleshoot that later. And if it's something specific that I'm doing wrong, I can uh, email everybody and include that as a um, possible caveat in the wiki documentation as well. So Blake, can can you um, remind me what the command, if you had gotten the file, what, what's the command you were going to run? I get. No, right, to pull the file in and then you were going to do what? Uh, yes, once you have, uh, so let's go back over here. Once you have that FASTA file and you have that peptide, those peptide files, that's when you start to move on. You just have to have both of those around because they're used in different parts in the rest of the, um, in the rest of the Trinitate workflow. Okay. So, uh, and I can show you where those two, those two files are used. They're used as evidence files. So the FASTA file gets annotated and then it uses those peptides uh, to find um, protein conserved domains in a few of these steps. And so I'll show, I'll show where each of those come into play. But we can actually move forward uh, with this first, um, and this is just a simple blast um, command, and you can literally copy and paste it from the website. These are also available in the wiki, of course, if you just want to do that and not have to go through all of the all of the uh, documentation on Trinity. And if you go back, oh, my paste thing is not working. I think something's wrong with my actual computer. So what I'm going to do is move this over so that I can see. I will also uh, I will also say that having two screens is incredibly nice. Uh, and so I'm going to actually use my other screen, and I'm just going to type out these commands. You should be able to copy and paste it, but I think there's something wrong with my there's something wrong with my copy and paste. And that's part of what's causing them the trouble that we were saying before. So, so um, there's just a few things you're going to have to change, uh, and I'll show you exactly what those are in just a second as, after I type all of this. And I will also explain what each of these things are doing because I feel like uh, when when I was first learning how to use the command line, this was all pretty much Greek to me. But basically, what we're doing is we're telling Trinitate to call BlastX. It's going to look at or query that assembly that we did, and so this is the nucleotide assembly. You can also do BlastP. Um, you can do the BlastP on the peptides. And oftentimes people do both. You can do either or, or you can completely skip BLAST if you don't want to run BLAST. Uh, I will say that running BLAST is one of the longer steps in the Trinitate process. And so um, frequently people want to know the conserved domains and they just skip over BLAST altogether. I like to do everything. Um, and I, I, what's nice about Atmosphere and having a cloud uh, cloud machine or cloud computer is that you can just let blast run and if it runs for two weeks uh, who cares you have other things that you can do or you can read a book or whatever and so when I was doing this as a researcher I would set up these I would run let blast run for however long it was going to and every couple of days I'd check in on it and just make sure it was still running and that it hadn't finished and so basically that's sort of the workflow like a set it and forget it uh, rotisserie chicken kind of thing um, we're also here going to tell it to which database to use. So we're going to use the Uniprot. And here we're going to tell it how many cores this machine, your cloud computer, has. Now, last week we set this up, but in case you've forgotten, you know, because it can be several weeks sometimes, uh, all of that information is here in the actual Atmosphere user interface. And so that's the size of the computer I asked for a month ago. And it's got four cores. 
So that means that we actually have to change eight here, which is the default that Trinitate puts. We're going to change it to four because we have four cores. If you, if this was a larger instance, we do have instances that have eight cores. You would just leave that eight cores as it was. And then um, here you can change uh, how many target sequences are found. Um, and then we're actually just going to tell it to output into this file. And that's what this little carrot and daily bob is here. I'm not going to run this because this will run uh, for a very, very, very long time. But basically what you do is you would set this all up and all you have to do is press enter and it'll run. And it will take all of those transcripts that you have here in this Trinity assembly and it will blast them against the Uniprot database. And as you can tell, that's going to go for a while because the Uniprot database is huge. It's every known protein or every known nucleotide uh, coding sequence. Um, and they're all unique. So um, as I was saying before, Trinitate is actually several tools. So you would, you would run maybe the Blastex first. If you wanted to do BlastP as well, you could totally do that. Or you could skip that. They're, all of these steps are optional. The more you do, the more information is returned to you. Um, but of course, the longer it will take. So the only difference in the blast P is that you're going to use that peptine, uh, that peptide uh, translation that we got from the trans decoder, um, the one that I had a little bit of trouble um, pulling in. And it will go, it will output to that file as well. The second tool that people run is uh, called Hammer, and this is, uses uh, hidden Markov models (HMMs). These are all very cleverly named, right? Uh, H HMMs to actually identify protein domains, conserved protein domains. And so in much the same way, you would just copy and paste this into this terminal, delete all that, and again, it's not going to work for me because something is weird with my copy and paste on this Mac, but you would just paste that in, and the only thing you've got to change, again, is the CPU to 4 because we only have 4 CPUs. And it'll run, and it hit, it'll actually look at the PFAM, the protein uh, database, and take all of your transcripts and look, or all of the peptide uh, translations of your transcripts and look into that PFAM domain, and then it puts it out into a file for use later. And so you would basically just go through one at a time, uh, copy and pasting these at, after they're finished. So signal P is the next time. This looks for signal peptides at the beginning of transcripts. Um, and so those are very interesting if you're looking at where proteins are going to wind up inside of the cell. Uh, if you have pro or if you have eukaryote, of course. Um, there's also a tool for finding transmembrane domains for all of the membrane-bound uh, proteins. So you're going to take that protein translation and then use this transmembrane HMEM, and you would just copy and paste each of these into your command line one by one by one. Again, because this will take quite a while, I've already done this. Uh, beforehand, and I, I'll show you the output of all of these here in just a few seconds. Uh, uh, RNA hammer, and on and so forth, until you get done with everything. And that will actually populate a number of these files, and then all you have to do at the very end is load these all of those files that you've generated with all that information uh, into a single database to um, make them all into one place and a place where you can actually look at them. And so you do that here. So you tell Trinitate to call a script called Trinitate SQL, SQLite, SQLite is a database. Um, you, and you input all of those, that information. So you're going to put your FASTA information in there. Uh, here's the FASTA file. You're going to put your pep, uh, peptide sequence in there. These, this is um, the command to load up all of your protein and um, blast X and blast P searches. And so again, you would just literally copy and paste this. You're just telling, you say Trinitate, I want you to put it, put all of this information, the blast P output into that database. And then I want you to put all the blast X information into this database. And so basically the workflow is you use all of these tools to actually find information about your transcripts and your peptides. And then those will output those files. And then you just take each of those files and load them in to SQLite. And you can, you can actually do this after they complete, too. You don't have to wait to the very end. Um, you can load them up uh, as they come off. I like to wait to the very end just so 
I'm doing everything kind of like through and I can sort of check everything off. And you just keep going and going. And then eventually you get a, a Trinity um, SQLite database and you can actually output the report. And there's a number of very interesting things you can do, but it's all very well documented here. So I'm not going to go too far into the weeds there, but let me show you what actually comes out. So after you've done all of these annotations, you get a report that looks a bit like this. And it comes out in a big uh, tab separated file that you can open up with Excel, or you can open it up right here, or you can open it up with notebook or notepad or any of that kind of stuff. These are all gonna be your gene IDs. So these are some unique gene names. Uh, as you're doing the assembly, it will also, you know, uh, it'll give it a transcript ID. And then each of those tools will load their hits into here. And I know this doesn't look very exciting, but this particular gene here was found to have a protein. It is that long. Those are the coordinates um, for the size of that protein. Um, and for whatever reason, that protein didn't hit any of these other databases. And so essentially you get a very long list of all of your transcripts and all of the associated peptides. So this one actually did uh, find a hit. It hit human something. Um, protein in the PFAM, it's a kinase, a tyrosine kinase uh, protein that was this in humans, right? And so that's the link. And then it actually will actually, it'll output Go terms and it'll output Keg uh, orthologies. And I don't suggest doing this for hundreds of genes. You can even copy and paste these orthologies, these, uh, uh, or these ontologies, I'm sorry, these unique identifiers. And you can literally Google search them, and you can find uh, the the keg orthology matching matching hit. And so you can start to kind of investigate some of this. This is not something you can do. I wouldn't do it this way for again tens or hundreds of genes. I'm just saying that all that information is in those files, and that's really what you want to get to when you get to your annotation. Um, and this again, this is a kinase, a tyrosine kinase of some kind in the fur family. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but so after that, that's really what you want to do. And that's the whole point of doing this long annotation. You're going to get uh, tens of thousands in this case of hits, and they're all going to have different function, uh, functionalities associated with them. And we're working on an, uh, an annotation pipeline that will take this and actually do go enrichment. It'll do um, keg assessment, and you can actually see which genes you got and what pathways you've got. And that's actually what we're going to be working on over the summer. That'll be the second half of this effort. So the first half of all of these pipelines is just to get you to the annotation. The second half of pipeline that we're going to be working and developing on um, will help you get from the annotation to biological, you know, broad scale biological understanding of your non-model organism. Um, of course, these tools already exist. They're already out there. And so you could easily go through all this and then learn the tools on your own and leverage uh, the keg, uh, keg or other um, pathways or, or tools. Um, we just want to develop one that will also be inside of uh, Cybers and reach out to those tools as well. And so that'll be the second half of our work now that we've completed this first half. So that's annotation and that's how you get there. And then that's kind of the workflow. And again, it's just a matter of copy and pasting um, and just changing one or two little things um, to match uh, your cores for your um, cloud computer, which again, you can find here, this is my, uh, this is the name of that cloud computer, this cloud computer. Um, and all the information is here. You just have to look and see how many CPUs you have, okay? So that's annotation, and that's everything you have to do to get through annotation. And I would argue that annotation is one of the most difficult things you have to do as a bioinformatician. Uh, it certainly is the thing that drives me most crazy. But it gives you lots of great information about whatever it is you're looking at. So that is the first half of what we're going to talk about today. From here, we'll move into doing differential gene expression. But I want to take a brief pause. Um, and let's see, what kind of time are we working with? Oh, excellent. Right on time. Uh, take a brief pause and ask if there's questions. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yes. 
Uh, is there a similar app for annotation on discovery environment? Ah, so annotation is a very com uh, computer resource intense process. And so um, traditionally we have put a few annotation um, uh, tools onto the DE, but there were so many problems with them um, because uh, of all of the resources associated with them. I find it actually faster and more straightforward to move it out and use it on uh, Atmosphere. Um, we will have Trinitate on, so all of the assembly stuff will be on the DE very soon. And in fact, we're, it's done, we're just testing it this week and next probably. And so sometime in the next month or so, um, that will be available. So literally you would be able to do everything in this pipeline. And of course the documentation will be updated to match all this. You'll be able to do all of that on the discovery environment, except for the annotation. I still argue that doing the annotation where you can do it hands-on one at a time and let it run for weeks and weeks and weeks um, is the way to go. Because uh, a lot of uh, HPCs will cut off your analyses after 48 hours or a week. Um, and with annotation, you especially when it comes to plants or some of these really complex organisms, uh, you, you really can't get it done in just a few days to match HVCs. You have to let it run. And so um, that's the one thing I would say. Uh, yes, which atmosphere image? Yes, of course. And of course, this is in the wiki as well, but let me go back. If you go to images and you search uh, Trinity or Trinitate, so let's do Trinitate. You can actually search through all these and you can find the images. I do this. Or get dizzy watching the thing go around. There we go. Yeah, yeah. the Sun Corridor Network has been, uh, they upgraded it a week ago and it's been a little weird, uh, but it'll get sorted out here soon. Uh, so this is the one I've been using, the version three from Cynthia. And it has Trinitate 2.02 uh, and 2.11 of Trinitate. And again, uh, version three of Trinitate is available and I'm testing that. So um, I will, I will uh, finalize the release of that um, in the coming weeks and I'll, I will delete all these other ones and make a completed um, image. And these may not even be visible to you guys when you search them. I don't think they're public. I don't think they are. Yeah, I think only I can see them because I'm developing them. But you'll see Trinitate three show up. And I will say Trinitate three is a lot more streamlined and it's a lot less computationally intense. I think they went in and probably refactored. Um, and regrettably, I don't have the data to support that, but just having hands-on, having tested it with the same data set, it goes, it seems to go quite a lot faster, but we'll see. Uh, I can certainly look into all that sort of thing. So if you, again, if you just search the images, uh, it's, they're fairly easy to discover. And the, we only have Trinitate 2 uh, tested and available uh, right now. Hopefully that answers the question. Transdecoder. I'm concerned if Transdecoder will be able to handle close to 250,000 contacts, which has always been the case for me. Say we get 250 to 300,000. Wow. That's a good one. I've actually never uh, done 300,000. I've done 160,000, somewhere, so like half of that. Uh, actually, if you would let me know how that goes. The nice thing about the discovery environment is uh, it, it'll take you four seconds to actually submit that and see whether it's gonna work or not. Um, and I kind of like that, especially for people like most plant researchers that have these kind of interesting edge cases. Um, you know, most microbi microbial researchers won't have 300,000 contacts. Um, and a lot of these apps are, were originally designed by groups in the human and microbial worlds. So the plant, plant world always stress tests these things, but 300,000, that's a new one for me. I bet, I don't see why it would be a problem because trans decoder goes pretty quickly. Um, in fact, I think I submitted the trans decoder, it's already completed, right? And I don't remember how long that took, but it was only a few seconds or a few minutes maybe. So Blake, can yeah. you, um, so for, oh, so that's Padma. Um, when she runs that, if there is a problem, can you show her where the the new um, troubleshooting help? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's going to run just fine. But if it doesn't run fine, um, you can actually go. Um, let me close up some of this. 
uh, if you actually open this uh, button here called analyses, it will show you all of the analyses that you've run. And we've been testing one of the new Callisto versions, so I have a failed one here. So imagine this was your trans decoder that failed. Uh, you would just click on this. And if you actually click on failed, it will give you some kind of triage options here. So you can, um, oftentimes things fail because of the inputs. And so here's some like best practices, you know, no special characters in the file name. I also like to include no, no spaces in the file names, um, et cetera, et cetera. But then um, if you're actually having a problem with an app that is public, you can post a comment um, or you can actually find if none of that's going to help you and the comment isn't answered in a timely fashion by uh, one of the developers or one of us, you can say, I still need help. And here uh, it'll give us all the information. So for you, this would say trans decoder. And you would put here something like, I tried trans decoder with 300,000 contigs and it blew up or I don't know, it failed or you know, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, you would say, you would tell us some information and then we would be able to actually look at it with you and see why 300,000 contigs would have made it fail. Again, I don't have any, um, I don't have any knowledge of why that would actually make it fail. And I'm, I'm fairly confident it'll work, but I, I'm looking forward to, if it works and it doesn't fail, I'd love you to send in a, a ticket anyway and just say, hey, that works. So I know that it worked. And then the one thing that's new is uh, here you click to agree to share that analysis with us so that we can look at it and help you. If you're nervous sharing uh, data and other analyses with us as science and petitions, you can actually look this up here and then specify, uh, I want Blake to look at this or I don't like that Blake guy. Uh, don't let him look at this. Let one of the other science and politicians look at it. Um, and if, you, if you have a conflict of interest potentially with someone because they do research in the same area. That's exactly. Yeah. So here you can see, you know, my background, what I do. I have a GitHub and Scholar, uh, Google Scholar profile. These are, you know, all, and you can get my all my publications and see if I have a conflicting interest or otherwise. Um, and so that's our new kind of help. Um, workflow and uh you know hopefully and i'm not going to submit this of course because we had, we don't know if that's true yet or not but, yeah um, so but that's how you do it yeah sorry um so i want to encourage everyone to s submit the old way so to submit using this new way to ask for help because it makes it much more efficient for us we get the information that we need from you the first time whereas the old-fashioned way when people would just email support they would say you know, my analysis failed and we wouldn't know anything. And there would be a lot of back and forth emails. So we hope that this um, gets the answer to you more quickly by providing us with more information up front. So um, we encourage you to use that. So sorry, yeah. that, that, that's enough of my advertisement. Are there any other questions for Blake? You know, while we're on the topic, let me show you one more thing. Um, I'm a big proponent of iteration in any of my sciences. So if something actually fails, I'll also frequently do this. You can actually click on this uh, analysis tab and there's an option here to relaunch. And we will actually, that uh, the DE will actually auto-populate everything that you did. It keeps your inputs, it keeps uh, your outputs, it keeps all the things you loaded. And if you think that maybe it was something like there was a weird name or you know, you selected an option and maybe that's what broke it. Or if you just want to try different ways or a different data set, um, that this reanalysis tab is really nice because you don't have to go back in here and remember, you know, in six months from now, you'll want to know uh, what maybe this one failed. What did I do that, or, you know, what happened that made that fail? You can go back in here and look at that. And then you can compare that to one that succeeds. Uh, so here's a completed uh, Callisto. You can open that one back up with the relaunch button and you can see, okay, this one worked. I should try to do it like this again. This other one failed. I should try not to do it like that. And again, these are kept forever. I have some in here from 2015, um, you know, and, and beyond. Yeah. I'm sure it's just showing you the first one. So I like to do that as well. Um, you know, it's good to go ahead and su submit the support ticket, but I also like to kind of play around a little bit just because it's so easy to do that. All right.
And with that, I think uh, I'm, so I'm gonna switch over to the differential gene expression. It should be much faster uh, than the annotation because it's a bit more simple and straightforward. So um, the example data that we have been working with doesn't have uh, two conditions. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and use a different data set. Um, and I'm, I'm very tongue in cheek in calling these uh, stationary invertebrate versus I have some swimming invertebrate examples and some stationary invertebrate examples. These are actual scientific examples that I've made them impossible to know what they are, except for one's a stationary invertebrate and one's a swimming, swimming one. And so basically all you need to do your differential gene expression is two things. There's a counts table and a target table. I'll show you how to generate the count table in a second, but let's just look at it and see what it is. It takes a second, here we go. So these are gonna be all of your contigs, all of your transcripts, and then you're gonna have all of your conditions. So in this case, we have two conditions. There's a wild type and there's a treatment. And we're gonna compare those two conditions to see what is differentially expressed between wild type and whatever this treatment is. And then what's here is actually raw counts um, from your transcriptomes. So what you're gonna to do to generate this is you have your assembly, that Trinity assembly we did before, you're going to take that and put it into a, an app, which I'll show you here in just a second. And then the app will take all of the reads, put them onto your assembly and actually count how many of those, uh, each of those contigs in each of these conditions has how many reads, how many counts are, uh, of those reads. So you can see in some of these conditions, you have eight, 54, 10, you know, and it kind of varies all over the place. And that's why it's really important to have triplicates. So if, you're, if you haven't started doing your sequencing, and you, uh, you're thinking about doing differential gene expression, triplicates is um, minimum. I know people who do five uh, replicates, biological replicates, but uh, triplicates is the absolute minimum. I would, I would recommend it because you do get some variation because there is, uh, you know, transcriptomes or transcripts are just so ephemeral. And even if you're getting the same tissue, the same time of day from the same organisms, uh, they, those transcripts can be very, very ephemeral. So replicates is the way to go, and certainly triplicates, biological uh, triplicates. So to generate this counts table, we're going to use, um, what I like to use Callisto because it's very fast. So I'll actually show you that. And all you have to do is type Callisto in here. We have a number of apps that will, um, that will look at the counts. So Callisto is my preferred because it, it's very fast and it's fairly robust and efficient. Um, salmon is one of them, and I believe we have salmon, and I have no idea how they name these things, but I, I love that they have crazy names. Yeah, here's salmon, uh, it will index and then quantify. Um, I believe we have Arsim. Arsim is a very, like, it's one of the original packages and people really like it, and so uh, people still use it, um, and we have that available as well. But basically, no matter what you wind up using, they all do something very similar, and that is to say, they're going to take the, the assembly, your, trans, your assembled transcriptome, and just overlay all of those counts, all those reads on there, and count how many reads each of those transcripts has. So this is the one we're working on. It should hopefully be uh, troubleshooted pretty soon, today even. We're pretty close. Um, but let me open that, and I'll just show you some of these. things. The very first step is to do, actually, we'll do it in two halves. This is actually the entire workflow. So if you'd like to go and do the whole thing, um, instead of doing it in two, two steps, if you just want to do it all in one step, this is the one for you. So we're going to do the indexing step, that is matching your transcript up. And then the quant step is actually overlaying all those reads onto that index and then counting how many each of those uh, transcripts, how many, how many reads are for each of those transcripts. So the only input you need to do is you give us a name, I like to call it, I like to put my genus and species in here and the word index. And then you're going to navigate to your FASTA file. So in this case, it'd be our Trinity FASTA file. This is our assembly uh, from before. And then your input here, oh wow, that was loud. Yeah, your input here is going to be um, your uh, reads. So you're gonna do your left and your right reads. 
and that's going to be uh, the quantitation. So literally those reads get put onto the index, which is this above step. So you do the index first, and then you add those reads onto the index. Um, and there's, of course, associated options. I'm not going to go into that. Ooh, can you guys hear that? Or is that just, I think my, my earphones are going out of power. You may have to switch here in a second. And then you just hit launch. And that will actually generate uh, accounts table for you. And that's how I got this, um, this original accounts table we were looking at. Um, it takes a little bit of a while. So again, I've done it in advance um, so that we don't have to sit here and wait for it to run for 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And so that's how you get all of your raw, raw rounds. Um, one of the major things I'll say is this has to be raw counts. Do not normalize these counts. All the DEseq or EdgeR, they all do internal normalization using these uh, replicates. So very, very, very important. And it's all in the documentation and it's in the actual original tool documentations in like caps and bold. Um, do not normalize, use raw counts. They take care of all that in a statistical manner inside of the tool. If you feed it normalized counts and it's expecting raw counts, it will normalize again, you're normalized, and then you're gonna have some uh, huge artifacts in your differential gene expression. And that is not what you want. Okay, so hopefully I've made that fairly clear. Um, raw counts only. And that's nice because all you have to do is just run the tools and you don't have to worry about statistics or figuring out, uh, oops, there it goes. So the only other thing that, that we have to generate is um, this file and it's called a target file. But basically it just tells us these are the labels and actually let me open up both of these so that I can show you both. And another little fun thing is it, there's this little option to snap left and snap right. And so it's really nice for when you're comparing things. So here's our counts table. These are the columns. Uh, these are the actual names of each of the conditions, each of the experiments or biological samples. And then we're going to put that into a label. So you actually have to type this up yourself as a text file. Um, and this is the, uh, I have some examples available and people can just, you know, change the names if you want to. Um, and so this is just going to tell us this first column is called wild type one, second column is wild type two, et cetera. All of those counts can be found in a single text, this counts text. Uh, sometimes uh, people will generate, you know, this one condition has uh, one file, this one condition has a separate file, this one condition has a separate file of counts. In case you have accidentally generated those files independently, you can use both, uh, you can use it either way. And then we're actually going to tell it our treatments. So this is a population, we're calling it groups in this case, and here's our conditions, five and 33. And that's what we're gonna wind up comparing. And so this is the only hands-on thing you have to do um, uh, for differential gene expression. So just really quickly, I'll show you the tool. Um, I'm going to use DEseq2. DEseq2. Again, we also have EdgeR available if uh, you prefer that. So we have this DEseq2 multifactorial pairwise comparison. I'm doing a single pairwise. But you can actually do you can you can feed it uh, ten different treatments, and it will go through and take each one and compare it to every other one and do multiple pairwise if you would like to do that. And all you have to do is just you know include all of those conditions in that target file. So the first thing we're going to load up is that target file. And oh, actually let's do it this way. We have the target file here. So you can actually just take that and drop it in and it will auto populate that. I kind of like that. Um, and then we're going to give it the raw counts file that, and we can refer, it refers you back to the original documentation um, and the wiki about why you need the raw counts file. And you can either give it a single file that has all of your raw counts merged into one. And that's what we have in my case, or you can give it a folder of raw counts and it will go through each of those and match them up to the target file. Like I was saying before, so don't worry if you have, uh, you know, a single, you know, each condition counts is in a separate file. Some of the workflows will generate, you know, each condition has its own file. 
So that's the only the two things you got to put in there. There's the accounts file. Uh, the parameters here, you're going to give it a name. I don't know, uh, Blake's project. I'm just called Blake project. No special characters or spaces. Uh, Blake is the author. We're going to tell it the reference biological conditions. And again, you'll have that information here in your target file. So what it's basically saying is which of those conditions is going to be your basal level. So in this case, I want to compare, let's say I want to compare five to 33. I'm going to say that five is my base. So when I go in and interpret this later on, I'll know that five is my base. So in this case, that's, we called it condition, con. So I'm gonna call it con. Oh, sorry, that's where, uh, that's gonna be five. And the, the variable of interest, the name of it is condition. And there's many other things here. If you wanna, uh, there's transformation methods. There are several available. Um, and I believe those are in the information tab. It's in the documentation as well. Uh, yeah, here's the, the two possibilities. Um, and there's lots of statistical things that happen and you can choose uh, p-value adjustment methods for, um, you know, and this, this is fairly important. Most people use that method, but of course you can also change it according to many of the other available, if you want different statistics from it. And I'm just gonna launch that. Um, and it will take all of the, and it will run that app. I've already done this, of course, so let me show you what actually outputs. And what's really nice is, um, because you get lots and lots and lots of files, um, here's all the text files. There are a number of images um, that come out and you can actually upload each of these. You can download these, you can put them into, oh, right, we, uh, we can't edit uh, PNGs. But you can download these and look at them. But what uh, Upintra has actually done is he's written a quick R markdown HTML file. So let me go back and show you. There's this report that actually gets generated so that instead of going through each of these by hand and looking at what comes out, we actually drop everything into a report. And that report actually describes everything and it gives you references for how the tool is run and everything. So literally by running this tool, you can turn around and hand this to your collaborator or your PI or whomever, and they will know, here's the conditions that I ran, here's those wild type and treatment conditions, um, and you know, here's the quartiles of each of those. It gives you total recount per million, so there's a TPM for each of the condition sets. Um, and it goes through and it gives you a lot of summary statistics about the original data, it, it will tell you, um, it'll give you scatter plots and information. Uh, but one of the things I really like is they will do a principal component analysis and actually show you which treatments are most look like. So obviously something in this wild type, when we collected it, um, perhaps something was very different about that because wild type two and three, uh, you know, cluster together pretty nicely. The treatments uh, cluster together pretty nicely, but this one is sort of something of an outlier. So it's perhaps, um, something's weird about that. And you may consider dropping that out of your analysis and redoing all your analysis um, because you don't want that skewing your data. Um, it will also show you all of your, all of the normalization steps. And I really like this because you can actually see what your counts look like before. And you can see how they normalized, how the actual um, tool normalized all of that and compared them. And you can see that the normalization is very nice. It really does get them all kind of into the same line. Whereas before there was one outlier or some the two, you know, two things that were kind of different than the others. Um, and it gives you your volcano plots and everything else here as well. Um, there's the volcano plot. And so it's just, and this is automatically generated. You don't have to spend the time to put any of this together. And at the very end, it gives you a bunch of references for how that tool is run um, and all of your methods and everything. And I really, really like that because now you've got an actual output that explains everything. And it's as easy as that. And in fact, it looks like uh, that one I ran is already completed. And I think this is like 50,000 transcripts. So you saw how fast that ran. If we just click on that, it'll take us to the output. Yep, and here we go. Uh, 33 versus five, five was our condition. So all you have to do is change your experimental conditions. 
and run these apps and you can actually play with it, right? You can go in and say, okay, maybe I want to think about treatment 33 as the basal and what's different is five. Five is different, so I'll rerun it, but it flipped. Um, and here you start to actually explore all of this data instead of spending your time trying to figure out how to run uh, and install software. And that's really where we want to get to. So that's the output uh, to date. And of course, uh, you have all of this output as raw. So you can go in and, and find any of that data that was used to generate um, the pictures. And you can make your own picture or your own figures uh, if you'd like. You can change them around. You can explore which of those um, which of those genes are upregulated, which ones are downlink regulated by digging into the data that's available here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, all the instructions are on the, so uh, I'll go ahead and take questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, yeah, don't worry about the time. Go, so there okay. were, it goes back up to the reads when you were okay. emphasizing using the raw reads. Are those filtered after quality control? Filtered after quality control. Sorry, uh, if I said reads, uh, I meant, uh, Counts. Those are the raw counts that will come out of Callisto or Salmon or um, RSIM or whatever. So yeah, the raw counts files you want. The reads, the reads are used to generate the counts table. Does that make sense, Fatima? Hopefully, let me know if that doesn't make sense. Um, salmon output is already a normalized count table. Can this data be used on DC2 in a jar? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, I've actually not used salmon going into. Uh, I'm not sure about salmon going into DEC2. Um, I'll look that up and get back to you on that one. Uh, and I believe I have your contact here. Yeah, I can do that. Um, the salmon output for in R in the DE, I don't know if it's normalized or not. Let me double check with that. I know that when you run the salmon locally it does um it does normalize and you tell it to normalize and you tell it all that stuff i think the the one on the de doesn't do that but i need to double check that one that's a great question and i will write that down in fact uh the instructions are all on the wiki let me i'll go ahead and paste that and there's also a publication as well and that uh let me I will give you the publication and I'll give you the wiki because the publication actually has a video of how to run this stuff as well. And you can of course use this webinar. Um, so here's the uh, Jove publication. Uh, oh, so wiki is in there. Uh, so you're, we're seeing the workflow. What, yes. Uh, yeah. So um, the I I posted uh, the Joe publication in the chat. Ah. Okay. See it. Yeah. I, we're going to be finishing up soon, so I went ahead and uh, moved this slide down. Um, so the reads uh, that are used to generate the counts are those filtered? Yes. They they can be. Uh, Padma. Um, the reads that are used to generate the counts, you're going to want to use your filtered and trimmed and nice reads that you use to make your assembly. That's correct. Uh, some people, when they go to their sequencer, they actually already have, like their sequencers will actually do the quality trimming and the filtering and everything. So not everyone has to do the filtering or the trimming on their own. Um, but you do want to use the ones that, whatever reads you use to make your transcriptome assembly, that, those are the ones you want to use to generate your count table. Hopefully. Yes, okay, go. Um, yes, Soap De Novo uh, can absolutely be, um, yeah. So any of these things that, like for assemblers, there's a number of different uh, possibilities. Uh, those can absolutely be um, uh, substituted. Of course, the only difference will be that they'll, they'll wind up being named, uh, the file, the assembly file will actually be named something different. And so um, 
that's the one thing. But yes, you can, I've even used, like I've had people that I've worked with that use CLC bio to do the assembly because that's what they were comfortable with. And then we moved that assembly out and into the discovery environment and did the annotation and differential gene expression. Uh, and let's see, is there a rule of thumb for minimal sequencing depth for eukaryotic samples? Oh boy. <laughs> that's a month long conversation we could have on that. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, generally people think of it as 8x coverage for genomes. Usually with a, a large amount, uh, and for transcriptomes, the problem is, is you never know how much coverage you have really, um, because you don't know how many transcripts are supposed to be in your transcriptome because it's, again, very ephemeral. Um, so coverage in a transcriptome doesn't mean the same thing as in a genome. But I would say that you do want to have, um, there are some power calculations you can do, um, and that, that would be a whole discussion for another time, um, but it's a great question. Generally, um, any amount of sequencing you're going to do, uh, your sequencers can help you uh, kind of, you can ask those questions of them, and you can generally get an idea of whether you have enough. Um, but there are power ca calculations associated with it. And I believe one of the tools that I like to use is called Scotty. Uh, literally, it's a power, like beam me up, Scotty, uh, power analysis. Um, and I can, I'll put that into the chat window here in a bit as well. All right. Yeah, we're starting to get close to time. How are we doing on time, Martha? Um, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. We'll, we'll be fine. Well, then uh, let me show you guys one thing. Um, I showed you the analyses uh, button and how to troubleshoot in the DE. But we also have something new in the in atmosphere that we're testing out called intercom. And let me show you that. It's actually an interaction. So if you're in atmosphere and you have questions, you'll notice that there's this button down here. And I can start a new conversation and say, hey. Testing out. And it's actually a way to converse with our support staff. Um, and so um, from nine to five, our time, people are looking at this, that support and they're going to chat with people. And um, it usually takes, it, sometimes it's an immediate response. Sometimes it takes a few hours. Um, this is where we're standing there. So I'm just gonna show you that. And this is actually a good way oh, to yeah, interact. So. So, that's one of our uh, one of our developers, um, Andy Leonard's, and uh, so <laughs> he's sociable. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if you have a development question, they can help you. If they if it's a science question, they move you over to one of the science analysts, like myself, and you can converse back and forth um, instead of submitting a string of emails to troubleshoot what we call. So we're testing this function out. This is new. It rolled out last Friday, I believe. Uh, we have one more question from Padma. Are the results of analyses also available in the documentation? So if we try, we are able to understand better. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, let me point that out. Thank you, Padma. Um, all of these, I've put all of this into a public folder. It's in community data. And it's in the Trinity Transdecoder Trinity databases. Um, I have all of this example data. And so literally everybody has access to my analyses. Um, and also those databases uh, are there um, for when you're doing the Trinitate setup. But uh, so I have some fungal examples. I have several of the invertebrates, you know, the swimming and the stationary. I have, uh, I'm going to be adding some plant um, examples. I just don't have any of those in there. And of course we have the Trinity, the official example data set that we've been using. Um, that we well, we used it all the way up until uh, differential gene expression because they didn't give me two conditions. Um, and so, if you go in there, you'll be able to see all of these outputs. Um, for the differential gene expression, if you want to com compare it, um, you'll find them here. Oh, where? But these are all linked on yes. the wiki, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're they're all linked. So they're Correct. yeah, you you can find them pretty easily. Yeah, so those are all available, yeah. 
and if there's something, if you can't see something for us, just shoot us a support ticket um, and I can make sure that we can get it to you. But these also, because they're in that community data, should be available on our mirror site as well. Is that, isn't that correct, uh, Martha? Uh, yeah, the data commons. Yeah, the data commons, sorry. Uh, okay. So, so I would, I would contact support like we did before, right? And so yep. if you're in atmosphere, you just uh, chat through that little button on the bottom right. If you're in the discovery environment, again, you go, let me close all this. You go to the analysis tab. Um, and if you're, you know, if you have some questions about the pipeline, um, you can certainly, you know, just send it, send in a, um, I, I need help and just say, hey, you know, I have a question about the Jove pipeline. I can't type today. I, I need more caffeine or less. I'm not sure which it is. Or, you know, the de novo non-model organism pipeline is what I've been calling it. Does that yeah. make sense? Cool. Yeah. And, and Sorry, the, the reason we encourage you, so if you're in the DE or in the atmosphere to use those methods, um, is, not, is that a lot of people see it. We have trouble with users emailing individuals, and then the individuals might be traveling or working on a grant, and they don't get back to people very quickly. So it's much better to use the built-in support that we've got, and you can still email support at cyber if it's a general question, but if it's a specific problem with the analysis, it's better to use the help that's built into whichever platform you did the analysis in. We get, yeah, because just more people see it and, and you get better help and quicker help that way. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Can you go to the left? Yeah, thank you. All right, I will send out a follow-up email with links to the materials as soon as we're done. Thank you, Blake, and everyone yeah. who came in for part two. All right, have a good weekend. I'm gonna, whoops, not that. Um,